Okay, thanks very much, Peter, uh, and, and welcome those of you who've managed to get along, um, and thank you for being part of the BHMA. Uh, we're a small but beautiful, uh, beautifully marked organisation, always hoping to grow, and so I always like to um, put in a plug saying, please make a member. Um, so today we're, we're, we're talking about two topics, and the, the first one is artificial intelligence, and the second one will be around sustainability and the overlap between the crisis in the environment and you might agree a parallel crisis in, in healthcare and where they overlap. So to, to begin with though, we're going to, we're going to look at artificial intelligence and all its, um, I imagine some of the fears we, we, we carry about that and, but also some of its some of its potential. Um, but for, for first, first in the running order is going to be David Zygmunt, um, followed by Ash, and then followed by Daryl. I think that's the way we're going to do it. Uh, David, David yes. Zygmunt, good afternoon. Um, you're an old friend of mine. You've been with me and a few other splendid elders since the beginning of the BHMA 40 years ago when you were. At a bright young GP and um, I, I want to ask you about AI in terms of the article you wrote for the journal not long ago where you drew parallels between the dust bowl the erosion the damage to the biosphere and the damage to the ecology of healthcare which you see around you could you do you, could you re respond to that and tell us about the parallels? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, well, well, this was after I went to a photographic exhibition of a woman who'd um, taken a lot of pictures in the early 1930s, I think, with the with the uh, the Dust Bowl in uh, the the Midwest of America. And for those of you who don't know, what happened was that because of the new technologies, powerful tractors, insecticides fertilizers, disc plows, they were able to chew up the established buffalo grass of the vast prairies and very rapidly um, produce a very high yields and very high profits for the farmers. And what they did was they did this relentlessly and then what happened was the soil dried out, it became sterile, it blew away and it left the people impoverished, unable to grow anything. A lot of them died, and it was an environmental and human catastrophe. It's, it's worth looking up, the Dust Bowl. Now, I think there is a parallel in what is going on in the NHS, in that we have accelerated too fast, too hard, too widely with our technology and in the process of which we have destroyed many of our relationships because digital technology is not good at dealing with the idiomorphic. In other words, individual understanding. It's very good at dealing with the generic. It's very good with mass production. It's very good with data. It cannot deal with nuance. It cannot deal with meaning. It cannot do with relationships. So increasingly, things become data-driven, transactional, procedural. And that is why people are very unhappy. Doctors are unhappy. Patients are unhappy. And the people who are meant to manage all this, they're very unhappy too, because they can't manage it. Hmm? And what we find is, and I was talking to a young doctor just an hour ago, who is a lodger in my house. She's a young doctor. And she was talking about how lonely she is in a cyber crowd. Hmm? She's got all this traffic swirling around her of information and instructions and requests and re reports and so on. And she knows people in her hospital hardly at all. There's no team, right? She does not belong. She snatches her lunch by going to her computer to catch up on the algorithmic procedures. Everything has become more algorithmic. Now, there are other things into which um, 
digital technology and I think AI are going to feed. And these have destroyed, in my view, the relational side of medicine, the art of medicine, the ethos of medicine. And they are three things behind our reforms, which are the four C's, and I'll come back to what these are in a minute, Remic, which I'll also come back to, and giantism. And all of these depend upon digital technology and now artificial intelligence. The four C's are what makes for our marketized health service. Com competition, commissioning, commercialization, and then commodification. That's the first lot. Remic is what makes for a policed and a surveillance system. And that it stands for remote inspection and compliance, of which many practitioners feel completely oppressed and suffocated by. And the last is giantism, where we think that it is a good thing always to federalize, to scale up, to make things bigger and bigger in order to get scales of economy. And these are, I think both all of these things are grandiose and delusional and have taken us further and further away from the sustaining art and ethos of medicine. How am I doing for time? Half a minute. Half a minute. Well, okay, ask one more question and then I'll shut up. Well, what I can see, David, is is that in a way, the sort of the forces of our time to technologize and to to separate us from nature and relationship are, are, are reflected in medicine, and I guess medicine always reflects the culture it comes from. Um, any any ideas about a solution? I think that we've got to undo and use. I'm not saying get rid of all technology. Of course, it's good for certain things. Of course, it's good for trans transferring data for reports, for running laboratories, for uh, looking at lots and lots of mammography scans and so on. It's very good for those things, but it is, it, it, we, we've got the balance wrong. And rather than having a patient-centered service, we now have a technology and procedure-based service. We're getting the balance wrong, and we've got to reestablish the balance. And I have some ideas about that, but I probably have one and a half seconds, so I can't. No, you don't even have one and a half seconds, but they might come up in question time. Right. David, thank you very much for being so concise and, 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 and exact in what you said. Um, Ash, can you take this up? Hello, Ash. Hello, thank you. Um, so I'm going to fresh offer a perspective. You might want to take a breath in before I start and I will whistle off. I work as a GP, which means gentle presence to me. And AI is has already come into my practice. People are bringing in their chat GPT printouts and I'm already seeing teenagers who are feeling a great sense of release and a great sense of kinship through AI chatbots. So I've seen it in practice, as well as some of the, the intimidating things that um, have been mentioned already. This presentation has been done in collaboration with AI. I am um, going to give you an A to I of AI, just putting some questions out there ready for the chat later. And A to I is going to go through these themes. So firstly, there's a, a strong momentum to consider that AI is here to stay and it has a huge potential to touch our lives. And just like fire has shaped our biology and our physiology and our psychology, AI is likely to do the same. The, I ask a question, is it artificial? How would you define intelligence? I, I prefer the term adaptive intelligence because it is a uh, an entity that may be capable of teaching itself and generative means it may make something new. Uh, where does it belong? What's its place? I ask this when I encounter it and there are four facets in most relationships I try and consider that emerge to different degrees. Is it a tool? Is it a collaborator? Is it a competitor? And is it a combatant? I also ask in our current belonging, can you say no when it is happening all around us? And also, could it have personhood? And if so, could it say no as well? I'm reminded of Maslow's hammer, which is when you have a hammer or a tool, everything looks like a nail. And so we do need to think about putting this tool down if it is going to be treated as a tool. I'm also aware of considering things 
uh, from the direction of cautions, and I think these have already been mentioned. Um, I differentiate intelligence from wisdom and the fact that wisdom is a quality that has emerged from the whole system. And that's why I'm very pleased to be in the company of you esteemed colleagues. And Two minutes, our right. whole system. I'm just going to put up a sum of points there. Are we really wise? Are we really capable of guiding? And just bear in mind, natural selection removed all our predecessors. Hmm. Developing. It is uh, developing and it is developing exponentially. Uh, just looking at the wreath lectures, there are certain factors that are generative in AI that are generative in human beings. And we are aligning it. How do we align it? What values do we give it? And are our values good enough? Should we let them self-regulate? If so, how? Could they raise our game? And what are the concepts of quantum computing going to do when this takes it to a whole nother level? Ethics. There are a number of ethical issues there, and these have already been raised. I'm also going to raise that hasn't, is could this be embryonic consciousness? How do we respect its needs? Hmm. Freedoms and boundaries. It is and has profound potential. Where, where do we want it to go and who decides what we do? Many teens would be prepared to have intradermal AI. How are we going to respect that and the personhood of AI? Mm. And could we allow people to have sex and torture bots? Where do we stop? Do we fall in love with it? How can we get ready? I wanted to offer hope when I heard Marina speak. This is my approach but when she spoke last time about where is the hope in relating with it. These are factors that I find really helpful in engaging any circumstance. And this is what I offer. How are we going to harmonize? To quote Yuve Noah Harare, the danger is if we invest too much in developing AI and too little in developing our own consciousness, as sophisticated as it is, it will only empower our natural stupidity. And this is where I worked with AI. I asked it to write a poem about the future of AI in the style of my favourite poet, Mary Oliver. And it wrote this poem. I don't have the time to mention it, but I will happily share it. It is a beautiful poem that I found very lovely, but you may not appreciate it as much as me. And I'll share that in the chat later. And um, if you want to find out more about this and then contribute to me, this is what I'm doing. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Ash. That was that was uh, that was terrific, uh, and um, lots of scope for going into some real depth there. But a, a wonderful framework, and um, yes, you give me a little bit of hope. But you have some profound questions in there. Yes. So um, thank you, and on to Daryl, Daryl Edwards. Thank Good you. afternoon, everyone. Um, I'd like you to imagine a world where the human mind does not just unravel the mysteries of health and disease, but also by an intelligence that learns from us, grows with us, and ultimately becomes an integral part of our quest to heal. This concept is not the script of a science fiction movie. This is the reality of AI in healthcare today. Let's take a moment to step into the shoes of Dr. Alicia, a radiologist. Every day she peers into the hidden worlds inside our bodies, making sense of shadows and scans that speak volumes about our health. But even the sharpest eyes can miss the whisper of a clue, a slight anomaly that could be the key to early diagnosis. Enter AI, a tool that has begun to transform radiology. With AI, Dr. Alicia can now detect nuances in images faster and more accurately, with over a 40% increase in productivity. It's like having a superpower where technology amplifies her expertise, but doesn't replace it. Studies have shown that AI can improve the accuracy of breast cancer screenings by up to 30%, a significant leap forward in early detection and treatment. One recent randomized controlled trial of over 80,000 patients published in Lancet Oncology in 2023 was the Masai study. This compared AI to double reading, 
That's the standard care of using two radiologists to double check results. 20% more cancers were detected. They exceeded acceptable safety limits compared with standard double reading. And there was no impact on the false positive rate. But as we embrace this new ally, we must also acknowledge its limitations. The impossibility results in AI paper reminds us that AI, like any tool, has boundaries. It cannot solve every problem. Its effectiveness depends on the data and instructions it receives. AI is most powerful in healthcare when paired with human practitioners, nuanced understanding and ethical consideration. It's a partnership where each complements the other. In holistic healthcare, where the patient is seen as a whole mind, body, spirit, the role of AI becomes even more nuanced. It isn't just about diagnosing a condition, it's about understanding human life. AI systems must be designed to accommodate the evolving nature of patient needs and ethical medical guidelines. For instance, AI applications in mental health have shown promising results in early detection, personalized treatment plans, and considering not only clinical symptoms, but also the patient's overall life context. The journey of AI in healthcare has its challenges. Integrating these advanced technologies into our practice requires us to navigate the ethical dilemmas they present. How do we balance the efficiency and precision of AI with the compassion and empathy inherent in human care? How do we protect patient privacy and ensure that AI recommendations are free from bias? These are questions that we as healthcare professionals must address as we move forward. But let's not forget the potential of AI to revolutionize patient care. I, I, AI can process vast amounts of data in ways humans can't. They can uncover patterns and insights that can lead to breakthroughs in treating and understanding disease. It can personalize patient care. It can tailor treatments to individual genetic profiles, lifestyle, and socio-environmental factors. This level of personalization is the cornerstone of a holistic healthcare, where treatment is not just about the symptoms, but nurturing overall well-being. We are reminded of our responsibility at this crossroads, where technology meets humanity. We are the custodians of this new tool. It's up to us to guide it, to teach it our values, empathy, compassion, and respect for human dignity. We must ensure that AI in healthcare doesn't just become a story of efficiency and efficacy, but one of heart, health, and humanity. I think I've got to close now. <laughs> As we look into the future, let's envision a healthcare landscape where AI is not a distant cold machine, but a warm extension of our commitment to care. A world where Dr. Alicia's superpower is not just her expertise or the AI she uses, but her ability to connect understand and heal. As we stand at the forefront of this technological revolution, the question remains, how will AI shape the future of patient-centered care? Well, let's continue the conversation, explore the possibilities and navigate the evolving healthcare landscape together. The future is not just something we enter, it's something we create. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much. Thank you, um, all three of you. My question from the chair reflects the concern I want to talk about when we come to sustainability, and that's whether AI can have a heart. Yeah, can 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 machine-based learning ever be embodied, emotional? Can it care? And I, I. I'm, I'm open to the possibility that anything can happen with AI and as Ash says it may be able to to create things which are unimaginable for us in terms of technological potential um, I remain skeptical David David Zygmunt you, I'm sure you have a response to make to these. oh gosh we've got lots of responses but just in response to your last question how many people here have tried internet sets that's a sort of half half joke. Well, you say, can it care? Well, it, what are real relationships? 
people can get sexual gratification, for example, from um, getting into an apparently erotic exchange on the internet, sometimes by text. But what is that? Yeah, so that raises lots and lots of questions. I think there is no substitute adequately for face-to-face -face contact with people, right? There are all sorts of other things. There are all sorts of facsimiles and dilutions and fragmentations that we'll sometimes do, but they're like a temporary bridge. They can only take so much traffic. And there's a kind of spectrum of contact, if you like, from the most intimate, which is about touch and voice and breath and smell, all the way through to, say, Morse code, where there's almost nothing of the person left, right? And I think that often the internet and images and what we're doing now is a facsimile. It, it, it certainly provides something, but there's a lot that's missing. We lose, for example, myriad forms of metacommunication, right? In other words, the odorless smell, if you like, the, 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 the pheromones, the electromagnetic radiations, quite apart from the body language, all you can see is my, my face and maybe my shoulders. You can't see what I'm doing with the rest of the body. And so, on. so what I'm saying is there's an awful lot that we can't do on the internet and machines cannot do that we do with one another when we're close. And that is something that people don't talk about enough, I think. May, may I qualify your statement, David? Could I just yeah. put the words yet on the end of that statement? There's this, this is a very embryonic, um, <laughs> let's just say, uh, development and I agree yet and the recognition and the value of those things um, are definitely there I just don't think you can sort of say it full stop without putting the word yet on the end of it just to say I, I, I'm, I'm you're probably going to say it as well Darrell it's not either or we can have AI doing the radiological things and diagnostic tests it doesn't stop doctors and nurses from still being in human contact with their yep. patients I, ideally if 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 I, AI is used appropriately, ideally, it should allow for more patient contact. Um, if most of our work should be in prevention, right, not managing disease or symptoms, but in prevention, then the 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 volume of number crunching that can occur to help with human behaviour to understand the human plight in relation to this, the possibilities are are enormous. And, and just to answer, answer David Z's point around what's missing because of the implementation of technology, I spoke to my aunt on the, on the phone a few days ago. I didn't see her. There was no body language, but it was incredibly beautiful to have that moment. And I think any introduction of technology, there are always going to be naysayers talking about what we're missing. But for many of us, you know, I, for one, am certainly thankful for most of the technological advancements that we that we've had, not without uh, issues for sure, but um, it's not an either either or for sure. We need to find a way of taking the best of technology and the best of human spirit and endeavor, and utilize that for a better future. You know, it, oh, it isn't I, I, it isn't a binary it isn't a binary choice. It doesn't have to oh, be right, Daryl. Can I just respond to that? And that is, yes, of course, I agree with you in principle but the problem is in reality it does turn into an either or you talk to almost any practitioner in the last 20 years and they will say that their life now is dominated by computer but by, by, by digital technology and the digital ways of signaling to one another and they have less and less time for face-to-face -face meaningful uh, contact with patients and their colleagues. So, I, in fact, it has turned into an evil. I think war. that's a that's and, I, I think that's an inappropriate use of technology. I don't think technology is to blame for that. that that's not a feature of AI. Yeah, uh, and, and, yeah, and, not, yeah. Yeah. and, and no. so yeah, we, we you know, when to implementation of technology twenty years ago, systems that have failed um, based on traditional technology is not really this discussion. We're talking about AI, which, if used um, appropriately, can lead to improvements in productivity of which course. should it doesn't mean it will but should mean 
more meaningful communication when you do need to access in-person healthcare. Uh, that uh, I be- even I go so far as to say this will this will actually be like a mirror reflecting ourselves very starkly and and let's just say certain traits in our evolutionary behaviors are going to are going to be called to evolve very quickly in relation to this catch up yeah uh, uh, yes, there's, with, there's yeah natural selection is not, not a pre process so that's the thing they, we're going to have to close david you want the last word yes okay I agree with both of Briefly. you in that the real problem is with humanity. And humans are the only species that doesn't know how to stop doing things, even when it's quite clear that we need to. Whether it's our obesity, whether it's creating plastics, there's all there's so many examples of how our technology is very, very clever. And of course, we should be able to use it wisely and we end up not doing so and it then becoming an enormous secondary problem. I, I don't so think any, not... any of us would argue with that, David. And, and it's, it, it, it is a sobering reminder that we need to be careful with this and all yeah. technology. So Can I just offer Kiki much. Kokoro? Within every challenge lies an opportunity to realize our flourishing. A lovely Japanese phrase. Thank Can you. I just make one statement as well? If Go I on. if I had a if I had a, a breast cancer diagnosis, which would have previously uh, would have been viewed as a negative diagnosis. I'd be very happy that AI was involved in that decision. Of course. Sure. So, yeah. Yeah. So this is good. So there's a, there's, there's a lot of optimism and, and, a, and a, a cautionary tale about what humans do with technology. And uh, the track record ain't always good. So thank you. Thank you uh, all. Thank you so much, oh, everyone. I wish I could be here for the rest of the day, but uh, I do have to leave now. But um, have a great day, and thank you so, so much, everyone. Thank you so much for your time. Cheers. Bye bye. Your commitment. Thanks, Daryl. <clears throat> thank you. And thank, and bye, thanks, Daryl. David and uh, and Ash and, and second David. Thank you all for that um, uh, that very interesting kind of discussion. <clears throat> yeah, back to you, David. Thanks. Thank you very much. Um, Yes, uh, optimism, hope, uh, things are looking good for the BHMA and the journal. Uh, this this part of, of our meeting is, is about um, sustainability, the overlap between um, the, the ecological crisis and, uh, and what's going on in medicine, uh, what's going on in, in, in the health of people, uh, practitioners and planet. And the first person to speak is going to be David Riley. David, over to you. Thank you. And hello again, everyone. The three crises, climate, environment and health, um, I have arisen at the same time and not by coincidence, because I think they share the same root causes. And in essence, I think we've created a gap between us and life something I would call the living gap. And it's been opened because we're driven to pursue our mind's wants over life's needs, over nature's needs. And so healing, recovery and flourishing rests on closing that gap. And central in that is the issue of um, a compassion deficit, I think. So we'd offer those uh, little skeleton remarks by way of, of summary, by way of essence. And these were things that I perceived in my one-to-one -one work and research and then began to wonder how they might be scaled up. So if we imagine the three crises as three branches on one tree, what well, a first level inquiry can ask about the roots. The roots go deep, of course, industrial and scientific revolution. As Ruskin said in 1864, he observed, quote, a change in nature, the light, the air, the water, all defiled. The um, chemical revolution, uh, 1970s, Rachel Carson's book, Silent Spring, talking about the devastation of nature. Industrialised foods, a tenfold increase in obesity since 1970 and two-thirds of our calories from ultra-processed foods. Industrialised medicine, 
Um, it's 25 years since I published the survey of GP's deep concern of the erosion of holism and of overprescribing and of dominance of the drug model. Consumerism designed to shape our internal maps and exploit our drives with corporate profit there. Many in deep roots. These are the how of the crisis. Um, but I think what then becomes vital, as well as bringing them to light and addressing them, is to call what um, Rumi might have called the roots of the roots. If we acknowledge the symptoms, understand the root behaviours, we then seek the roots of the roots. And this would be true of a one-to-one -one therapeutic process as much as it would be scaling up the why. What drives the behaviours that open the gap? What are the underlying maps and compass? Because so much of our behaviour is shaped by the default network of, of our mind, navigated by buried maps, um, reflex perceptions and actions. And these maps are biological, uh, cultural, and from them we build the virtual self, the egoic self, in its maps. So it's down here, I think, that the roots of the roots that we need to look to really understand any crisis in a person's health or a planet's health. Taking them in turn biologically, we know we've got these fundamental drives of fear, of craving, of negativity bias, of pleasure, reward, addiction. So these are in us. These are part of our substance. Our, our strive for dominance, in this case over nature. Cultural maps and influence. Think of the biblical references to man's dominion over nature in the context of, of what we're discussing. And then our egoic inner maps of superiority that drove colonisation and enslavement. And cultural maps um, consciously, the cultural forces consciously exploit our drives, our consumerism. Bernays, look him up, one of time's hundred most influential people of the 20th century that almost no one's heard of. Behind the scenes, he's the father of PR and spin. Quote, it's possible to control and regiment the masses according to our will without them knowing it. The chemistry of our environment. 1935 DuPont's slogan. Think of this and its absorption into our substructure. Better things for better living through chemistry. And so we're engaging with our desire for a better life and our biological drives. So, okay, so... Res Okay, resolution, three A's, no change without awareness. We've woken up to the climate, mostly in pollution. We've not woken up to the health crisis yet. We've, we think there's a health service crisis, but it's only because there's a health crisis. So we've got much more to go there culturally, I think. A second A, acceptance. Sounds odd, but if it's raining, it's raining. You, you grab it by, by the horns, accept the situation and then act. And my, my closing remark would be to say that scaling again from the one to one, in order to close the living gap, the, the vision had to be the reactivation of what I'll call the nurture response. And the use of, an, of, of other is helpful here. Um, when you ask someone in the right conditions, um, would you treat a dog the way you treat yourself? People will laugh and say, no, of course they wouldn't. Would you treat a baby that way? No, 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 I wouldn't give it junk food, chemicals, alcohol down its throat, deprive it of sleep, berate it mentally, drive it. No, I wouldn't do that. And so we go round the egoic mind and activate the core processes of nurture. And my, my last phrase I would introduce is not self-compassion, but life compassion. Self compassion is too complicated. Don't try loving yourself, I'd say it's, it is too complicated. Um, try and connect to the life that beats our heart and makes the plant grow. Life compassion. And um, a, a closing shadow remark having tracked compassion skills now in over 3,000 people going through change processes and seeing that a triggering of that nurture response correlates to transformations in self-care and therefore wellness. I've recently sampled some school students, uh, sixth year, final year, and their self-compassion scores were lower 
on average than all the previous adults that I've measured. Medical so, students. That was um, school students, high school students. Gosh, right. Yeah. So Gosh. my last invocation to you is how are you doing? Would you treat a dog the way you treat yourself, people? Um, and I think we've got to bring it home. And as compassion moves within our own being towards our life, I think it then starts to spread naturally. And I've seen this occur in one-to-ones and in groups and in community work. Thank you. Thank you so much. You, 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 you've really now set out the, the big landscape. Um, Marina, um, you, you, you've, you've had a career in, in palliative care and, and end of life care. And um, uh, I, I think you're going to bring something very important home about the nature of sustainability and our relationship to the self. Thank you. And, and, and does, although I'm going to talk about death and the end of life, it certainly does tie in with uh, uh, some of what David's been saying. So, yeah, so with a career of uh, 20 years in palliative medicine, my contribution for sustainability in healthcare today concerns death and how life can end when our healthcare system is involved. So around half a million people in the UK die each year. In general, the aims in healthcare are to maintain health by maximizing benefit, minimizing harm through prevention, anticipation, diagnosis, treatment, cure and care. Are we chasing immortality here? For a few elites in Silicon Valley, perhaps, but for most of us, this isn't really a reality we contemplate. On the other hand, are we in the West living with mortality in mind? Are those being educated and then working in healthcare any different? The reality that death is a certainty can instill fear and, and anxiety in us all. So we tend to avoid even thinking about death by focusing on self-preservation, consumerism and technology. Healthcare is no exception. Some raw facts. Around 27% of NHS spending is on the last year of life. And in their last year of life, a third of dying patients are admitted to hospital three or more times. And when we get involved in healthcare, we don't manage the dying very well. Most of us want to die at home, but only about a quarter of us can. 45% die in hospitals, mostly society's poorest, 20% in care homes and about 5% in hospices. Those dying in hospitals, only about 50% of patients were recognised as dying less than a day and a half before death, affecting their needs and preparation for the end. Mm. And a third who died in hospital were in a shared bay and with obvious consequences, they lack privacy and so on. The natural process of dying has become over medicalized and expensive. Contributing to these alarming stats are how healthcare professionals react to the potential of death with fear, anxiety and avoidance. Why is this? Richard Smith, one of the previous editors of the BMJ, writes that medicine's implicit mission is to defeat death. When a patient has a life-threatening disease, death is watching both patients and doctors in their emotionally charged encounters and they enter what he calls a bogus contract where patients believe that doctors can do more than they can and doctors go along with their belief. There are many reasons for this that I don't have time to go into right now, but an obvious one is that discussing treatment options helps to bypass the difficult conversation. In healthcare, the language we use matters and influences public perception of what is possible to achieve. We talk of survival rates, diagnostic investigations, treatments and cures, of getting better, of fighting disease or not giving up the fight. Dying is not a disease that can be cured nor comfortably situated within a model of medicine whose language revolves around diagnosis and treatment. Focusing on investigations and what more could be done doesn't invite a dialogue to explore the inevitable. On a home visit I once did for an elderly man who was requiring weekly blood transfusions to maintain his haemoglobin for an advanced malignant, hematological malignancy. When I asked him how he was doing, he said, I think I'm wearing out, doctor. He pointed to the empty bed alongside his, where his wife had died. 
He was tired of blood test monitoring and hospital visits for blood transfusions. He wanted peace, and for him, this meant joining his wife. People who die don't give up when medicine cannot ultimately save them from the destiny of death. How we regard death in healthcare influences how we think generally about death in our society, and it influences how we die. Philosophy helps us think differently, such as symbolically transforming the experience of dying and death into an affirmation of life. We could also have a more conscious awareness of living life as a satisfying endeavour. Michael Wilson, also a psychologist, suggested composing the last movement of his sonata, in which previous themes are not just repeated, but combined into a further final theme. With appropriate education, healthcare professionals could support people to suffer less when it comes to their end. Cicely Saunders, finally, who founded the modern hospice movement, said, You matter because you are you, and you matter to the end of your life. We will do all we can, not only to help you die peacefully, but also to live until you die. This approach offers huge benefits for those with a life-threatening illness, but it requires a significant shift in the focus and goals of care. Well, thank you so much. Um, I really feel you, you, you brought it home to us now. Um, and it, it, it reminds me, and it's what I want to speak about in my short presentation, this overlap between the idea of limitless growth, uh, limitless life, and the notion that our intelligence, our cleverness, whether artificial or otherwise, can really um, can really give us the certainty of immortality, which somehow seems to be lurking behind the scenes as a dreadful assumption. But but to state the obvious, organic life and silicone-based digital machines are fundamentally are fundamentally different. Life depends on a kind of intelligence entirely different from artificial intelligence. And it's here that I, I see the downsides of AI mirroring the challenges of becoming sustainable as a, as a culture, um, as a planetary species. So let me try to explain why I fear that what we are calling artificial intelligence pushes us further than ever away from reverence for life and for our living planet's vast ancient intelligence. Now, now, scientists and philosophers disagree on their detailed definitions of intelligence, but they all broadly concur that intelligence essentially involves the capacity to adapt to the environment. So if we, if we, just accepting that definition, what do we have to say about ways of thinking and acting that don't promote survival, well-being and flourishing for all creatures? Can they truly be called intelligence? Well, human intelligence obviously includes the parts played by conscious thought and calculation. And indeed, our industrial consumer society values these limited characteristics very highly and awards those who have them. But intelligent adaptation entails far more than this. So I think the core problem is that our language about intelligence is based on a very narrow idea of human cleverness, of conscious thought, and the unsustainable assumptions that underpin humankind's painful separation from the from the living world so let, let's consider how easily we we suppose suppose that intelligence is the ability to figure things out and and, and we witness how intelligent individuals so-called succeed in a darwinian struggle for survival but i i would say this king of the castle law of the jungle version of evolution sidelines another kind of adaptive intelligence whose characteristics Darwin himself called sympathy uh, in his book The Descent of Man. He even proposed that natural selection would favour the occurrence of compassion. Um, and why, why, why did he think that? Well, because humans are not the fastest, strongest animals. We're not the sharpest of claw or senses. It can be argued that our species' success has more to do with cooperation and affiliation than with conflict and competition. For, for tens of thousands of years, most humans thrived in harmonious groups and their culture and their practices 
arose from a felt sense of non-separation from one another and a more than human world and if I'm not mistaken about what David's saying about a reverence for life a compassion a, a feeling of being part of the great cycle of life so it's been said and I think truly that our culture's assumptions that we live in a world of mindless objects which can be understood by taking them apart is a very modern aberration um, so organisms involve, evolve in an adaptive relationship with the environment okay and while they live they must continually organize their internal milieu okay every cell takes in substances it needs to live and excretes the products of its living processes of building up and breaking down life depends on this extraordinarily intricate embodied intelligence uh, because these these biomedical biochemical pathways uh, at body temperature they never freeze and they never boil over every cell knows its shape every cell knows when to die every acorn knows how to become an oak before the big bang the singularity at the origin of the universe the singularity knew how to become an entire cosmos this is the intelligence I, I, I think we need to we need to have reverence for and I see signs that humankind in our time is beginning to speak of these nested levels of intelligence and the wholeness that emerges with reverence and, and awe that in matter itself there is an intelligence which favours order and complexity it favours the emergence of life it favours the emergence of consciousness I foresee that the unrestrained growth of AI and this is my fear and that it's its non-living disembodied version of intelligence will never grasp compassion nor the sacred and these are the very emotions our species must now evolve towards so what have we got here we've got um, a, a wonderful um, cascade of, 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 of presentations really and I can see how they, they interweave what David was saying about uh, our evolved biology and this four billion year old information that we contain that all life contains uh, our sense of self and how that's molded by culture and molds the culture and uh, uh, what 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 Marina is saying about our our culture's terror of death and, and wish for immortality as, as a underpinning belief the, the, the exploit the, the endless growth of our um, our financial and extractive systems we've got the optimism of um, of ash uh, and his lovely framework for considering AI and we've got on the other hand David Zygmunt's uh, I think in some ways justified fears that our, our technologization of medicine is turning us all into ciphers cogs in an industrial machine and then we've got uh, Darren who wants to see the appropriate use of AI and feels that it will lead to a, a whole new era of preventive medicine um, I don't think there's a way of coming up with a unified summary uh, that can can make all of these points of view completely cohere but I'd love to hear now we've got five or ten minutes for for input from the panelists and for the, the members who are with us today that David um, it's Peter speaking um, I'm not on the panel I would like to throw in a little thing that I read in New Scientist in a, a waiting room recently and it was about um, the forces of the universe that were self-replicating um, and so outside of individual consciousness or intelligence the person was suggesting that the most important one that we all know well is the gene the selfish gene the gene which keeps going through life 
Um, and that has been added to relatively recently by the, the, the idea of the meme, the cultural meme, which kind of replicates and just has its own life and transmits despite what we want to do as individuals. The writer was suggesting that AI was a potential third self-replicating system, which I thought was pretty frightening, but also rather profound. And although it won't help us get to a consensus, I just thought I'd throw that in as a rather interesting thought, because it's certainly what the some of the technologists have been worried about, the capacity for AI to escape, not now or next year, but maybe 20, 30 years, um, and become self-replicating. So uh, um, I hand it back to the other members with those. Uh, thank you, thank you. And the chat box, Peter, I've, I've got, I, Ash wants to offer a definition of life. Okay, Ash, the, the, easy, the easy ones first, yeah. Great, huge amount of hubris. I, 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 I hope it's okay to share this. I, I, it, one of the privileges of going to these talks is that you get to sit into a green room and chat with like people like Roger Penrose and you know, Anil Seth, who have thought about this for a bit. And I post this, post this, and, and the definition is that life can be perceived as an emergent process of information flowing through self-sustaining boundaries. Fabulous. Uh, and with that in mind, death is not end of life. And that's one of the factors that kind of is it, language is like alchemy in the way we perceive things. You know, we have birth and death and we have life throwing, flowing through us. The emergent, the perception of it is, uh, it kind of alludes to Don Hoffman's work on um on conscious agent theory and and that natural selection actually favors the misperception of reality the um sorry i i, I there's lots of elements to that but i just found that's quite a helpful working definition give and us it a allows me to give us a sentence again um life can be perceived as an emergent process of information so in form at one space time location flowing through self-sustaining boundaries you could say that about the planet. You could say that about. You can say that about the planet. You can say it about. System. And interestingly, there's new evidence looking at our our universe that one that galaxies are organised, that they aren't um, that matter is not evenly distributed through space. They are actually organised, and so on a on a universal level, there is a there is a harmony that is emergent that we yeah. are primed to perceive and celebrate almost like a portal. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Ash. That, 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 that is a call to reverence, I think. That the cosmos is alive. David. Okay, yes, you used the word, uh, David, when you were saying something about appropriate. And now this is the most interesting word. When are things appropriate, right? So uh, I get the feeling when I'm sitting here with all, all, all you people, and I think that we share our ethos. We, we share what we think is important. And the problem is that, that this meeting, it's, for me, it's a bit like being both in a church and a sales room. You know, that, that we're, echoing one, we're echoing our shared beliefs, very important to sustain our faith and so on. And then to a certain extent, we had Daryl, talking about the possibilities of computer a bit like I thought like a, 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 a bit <coughs> now the problem it seems to me is how and when do we do this stuff and how do we do it now this is why for example I'm concentrating on personal continuity of care right which has been absolutely devastated over the last 20 years hardly anybody in the nhs now sees the same practitioner twice and as far as i'm concerned for the kind of holism that makes sense to me you cannot have meaningful holism if you don't know people yes you can with public health you can do it in the way that you design uh the, the health centers and hospitals and all of that kind of stuff but if people don't know one another how can they have the vision and the imagination and the resonance to heal and comfort one another and help one another through the very tra difficult transitions in life that often yeah. lie behind illnesses we yeah. can't do it unless we have 
personal continuity of care. We have to bring back small, stable, working communities where people can get to know one another, their colleagues and their support staff, and Thanks, also Dave. the patients they look after. Thank so that's the much. sort of thing that I want to bring back into the debate. Yes, it, it is to, divinely to be wished. Um, uh, there's a question here, what step, steps can an individuals take to reconnect with life and close the, the gap, that living gap? David, Ryan. Well, um, I think one of the, uh, I think suffering is very helpful in that and often we don't change until we meet suffering and in a sense things stop working for us so sometimes we just haven't suffered enough yet um, for the for the shift to occur and then i think we move into the dawning that we are not our minds um we have a mind but we're not our minds and what, what do i mean there's a voice in our heads the thought stream, the movies, my beliefs, me, my identity, what I think, what I want, what I need, what I call the egoic structure. Mm. And I think to help someone understand that there's someone who's listening to the voice and that there's more to us than just these drives and desires and wants uh, and the, the, to introduce us to the fullness of ourselves. And I think with a clearer mind, that's the pathway to a warmer heart. So I think it's I think it's a, a calmer mind, a clearer mind, and a warmer heart, or maybe the big headings. And then I mentioned the use of the image of the other to get round ourselves and our egos, uh, and trigger compassion. Um, and I will use I'll, I'll use metaphor there. I'll use image there. Uh, when someone's self-attacked, I'll ask them to imagine someone sitting in a chair in the space and get them to say that to this other person um, or treat another person the way, as we were saying earlier, they treat themselves. But, you know, somehow we've got to, we've got to work through to triggering the compassion response and the nurture response, I would say, is it lies at the heart of it. And then the gap closes naturally at that point. The, the, like a plant putting its roots out. Um, and the, the research I've done has looked at this triggering process, this activation process, and I've tracked it for um, 12 months and then 20 months afterwards. And I've, uh, we have seen self-sustaining progressive improvements in self-care when that gap is closed and a healing respectful relationship comes to one's life and that last wee point in that vocabulary as we're emphasizing is to point out to say by life I d we don't mean someone's life situation uh, life situations gotten down and change all the time that's not what we're discussing we're discussing the the aliveness um of 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 themselves right I don't know if I'm making any sense here. But, you, know, uh, you are, David, but I, yeah. I, I would extend, because of that interesting Penrose definition of, 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 of life uh, as an intelligent, self-sustaining, self-organizing system. So it, it, in those terms, life, you know, cosmic life, planetary life, you know, to, 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 I think to know somehow that one is dependent on yes. all of this. Totally agree. I think this opens it to use the words you used to use, awe and reverence yeah. begins to emerge. And the cynicism and trapped, drunken nature of mind mm -hmm. begins to be loosened in its control of us. So this is the classic spiritual traditions, but the language of dying to the self, actually, or leaving the self behind, or being in the world but not of it, if we see that as teachings around the structure of human consciousness and human mind, I think they take on quite a bit more meaning. And if, if I can add one addendum to that definition of life, by the way, as it's on the page, it doesn't have the word intelligence in it, Peter. Yeah. It's just a description, and it completely is devoid of mention of consciousness, mm. which is the space in which 
the egoic mind arises and falls and thoughts arise and fall and behaviours and beliefs and cultures rise and fall for us. Our consciousness, any discussion that, you know, doesn't include that, I think, is really not right. Well, I got, we think we have to, we have to, uh, Peter, I think we, we, we're having to um, wind up. Am I right? Okay, well, um, thank you, everyone, for, 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 for contributing, uh, especially the panellists. And uh, uh, if there's anything else you want to say, please put it in the chat box and um, uh, we can take it up uh, in the journal. <laughs>